Thanks, Simon. Very nice being here. Thank you very much for the for the invite. Okay, so where do you start? I mean, where do you start uh, with uh, the the presentation about what's going to happen to the South African economy over the next couple of years? I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Over, I don't even know where the rent is trading right now. I mean, I don't know really what's going on with what happened to the markets. So I understand the markets are up today, Simon. That's not, it's up, eh? Okay. <laughs> so it's still flat for the year. Um, I've got a presentation here that I believe is a, it's a little bit sort of offbeat, a little bit different from what you usually get from an economist. I hope so, at least. And I hope it's going to be entertaining. I hope you're going to like it, and I hope you're going to look at the economics slightly different. Because I mean, let's be frank, economists are very boring people, you know. And, uh, and uh, apart from that, economics is such an easy subject that economists go out of their way to give easy, easy things difficult names because we realize that if everybody realizes how easy economics actually is, we won't have jobs anymore. So we give it difficult names. That's the only reason why we are. Okay, let's have a look. Let's have a look, couple of things. Let's get going. And let's start at the most important part. And uh, let me put my cards on the table and tell you what my values are. My values are that I believe in private property rights. Those are my values. And with that, I actually mean the very broad definition of private property rights. Not only am I, is this my property and you can't take this away, but I also believe that my life is also my property. And if you, if you take this away, then we call it theft. And if you steal my life, it's called murder. But I also have the right over my labor. And I can do with my labor whatever I want to. I can sell my labor at whatever price to whoever I want to, wherever. In fact, if you look at it like that, then I am actually the most important person in this country. And actually, I really demand to be treated as the most important person in this country. And there's only one thing that really limits all these wonderful rights that I have, and those are your rights. I'm not allowed to take your stuff or to take your life either. So we are the most important people in this country. And the only reason why we have a place called South Africa and why we have a constitution and a, and a, and a parliament and, and a courts and all these sort of things is there for one reason only, and that's to serve us, the most important people in this country. And in fact, if you go back into history and see where we come from and you, and you, you, you follow the path of our development and our evolution to where we are today, you can actually pick up exactly that. For example, not, well, a couple of, about 100,000 years ago, we really, 100,000 years ago, we really started to think in an abstract way. 100,000 years ago, there's a, there's, a, there's a cave close to Stilby called Blombos, and in there you can find the oldest art of us humans. That's the oldest sign that we could start thinking abstract. 100,000 years ago also, we were hunter-gatherers mostly. And in a hunter-gathering society, there's very little that you can call your own because when you dig up something, you eat it. When you kill something, you eat it straight away. Private property didn't really exist. And gradually over time, we discovered a couple of things. And, and I would like, and I, I, I always tell people that all decisions are always economic decisions. And all developments are always the economic developments. Like, for example, an example of a, an economic decision is that the decision who to get married to is an economic decision. Because obviously, she's got to have a father with a bushfold farm. That helps a lot. But apart from that, it's, a, it's an exchange of love. That's an economic decision. And all decisions are always between at least two choices. And you pick the one that you fancy. And it's, it can be about money, but it can be about love as well. So it's an economic decision. And all developments and everything that happens to us are always about economics. And economics in the end is only about people. So gradually as we evolved over time, we started doing very, and we discovered all sorts of things. And we evolved over time. And one of the major economic breakthroughs was, for example, when we started walking upright. And you know, we've got extra tools available. Or when we discovered fire to protect ourselves, to cook our food, for instance. A major economic breakthrough, which happened approximately 15,000 years ago, was when we first domesticated animals. Now, that's important for a number of reasons. It's important because if you domesticate animals, then first of all, suddenly there's something that you can call your own. But apart from that, now you can produce a huge surplus, 
and then you can actually support a relatively large group. So the groups get bigger. Previously, the maximum size of the group, before we really had anything, before we domesticated animals, the maximum size of a hunter-gathering group was around 15 or so. Now suddenly we can actually accommodate, we can actually support a group of, of 50 or even 100. Another major economic breakthrough was when we domesticated plants, especially grain. Now, then all sort of other things happened. We started producing this massive surplus. And with a massive surplus, you can actually afford it to, to, to get somebody to look after your harvest, to look after your land. Uh, you can get an army. You can get all sort of, uh, uh, you can start to specialize. You can get people that specialize in, in, in looking after your harvest and somebody else that specializes in, in the religion, for example. And you need politicians. That was the real rent seekers coming to the fore politicians. But apart from that, all of a sudden, private property rights was ex ex extended to include things that weren't previously included in private property rights, like land. Because it's my plants. I planted those. It is my harvest. I'm going to harvest it in six months' time only. But now private property rights have been extended to something more. And gradually over time, you will find that private property rights become more and more important. And eventually we got to where we are today, and we created institutions like the, the courts, like a constitution. And the basis of all this is us to protect our private property rights, our physical property, but also our rights, and we call it human rights. My right to sell my labor, my right to contract, my right to be the most important person in this country. Approximately well, 2,000 years ago, there was a guy with the name of Plato, and he started playing around with a funny idea about collectivism, and approximately 150 years ago, and somebody else formalized all this, this idea of collectivism, and his name was Karl Marx. And if you analyze these two different systems that we have today, a free market system, whereby a free system where, where the, the, the basis of the system is private property rights, where pri property belongs to the individual, while this other philosophy called communism or Marxism or whatever you want to call that, the idea of that is that property actually uh, lands, or the most important person, if you like, is actually the Soviet, the group. Social property rights became important. And quite interesting, the Soviet Union used to be called the Union of the Socialist Soviet Republics. And a Soviet is a Russian name meaning a local authority or a local council. And if you really go down to the basics, there's not that really that much difference between a socialist system or communist system and a free market system. The only real difference is power is really down with the people. And on one hand, you've got power with the individual. And the other system, you have power with the group. Then, of course, over time, uh, which I think is a bit of an aberration, because actually, if you analyze the whole thing, individual private property rights became more important. But if you analyze what's happened is that what became important is that clearly is that this new system called communism, uh, the idea of communism is that is that I, it's not really that much different from what we have today called a free market system. And I'm going to touch on that just now. It doesn't mean we shouldn't have a government. Of course we should have a government, and the government's got certain roles. For example, governments should be responsible for collective goods. And the typical examples are things like defense and law and order and the judiciary, for instance. You can argue... They should be involved in healthcare and infrastructure and so on. But you cannot argue that government should be involved in, in an airline, for example. That's not their place. That's not government's place. Their job is to protect private property rights. That's their primary job. That's what defense is about, to protect me and my private property. Law and order also, to enforce contracts, my free contracts that I intend to enforce those contracts. Uh, the judiciary, exactly the same. So it is about private property rights. So we've got two systems, the one is a system of freedom and the other system, a collective system where things belong to the collective. It doesn't matter what system you choose, you always need to produce because you've got people to feed, you've got people to clothe, you've got people to house somewhere. So you must make, you must produce these sort of things. And in the free market system, we see, let's just give it to the people and let's stand back and see what's going to happen. And there are many examples where you just allow people to do whatever they want to, that they actually do the right things. The alternative is that you have you can go to a system 
the way you the, the where you everything belongs to the collective the soviet and then the collective will organize these sort of things and some and then people start producing this sort of stuff the problem is people tend not to if they if you put them in a club or in a little group sometimes they do produce if they believe believe in the in the in the bigger cause but quite often they simply do not produce initially you do find and you find it in the religions quite a lot where you tell people it's important to do a b and c for whatever religious reason and people do very stupid things because they believe in the course because they believe in the specific case but eventually people start forgetting about that and people don't want to produce anymore they don't want to work anymore because people are selfish beings lenin had the same problem when he took over uh, the soviet union or the then russia and he wrote an, an essay and this essay is called what should be done and quite interesting is that that was exactly the title or the of when they, if economic freedom fighters uh, when they started their political party they called that first meeting what should be done so what what does it say what does lenin say the problem is you've got individuals wanting to do their own thing well but in communism we're going to live in a world to quote Karl marx to everybody what he needs and from everybody what he can achieve or what he can afford i married to a russian girl and she told me they were all working and they're all waiting for the time when you can go into a shop quite literally and take what you need and you don't need money you don't need money in a communist system uh you don't it's there will not be famine you will everybody will work for the for the greater cause for mother russia for the example Ra lenin realized it's not going to work like this and lenin then said in what should be done he said in order to achieve this wonderful wonderful world of communism it is okay for the politicians to take the power and centralize the power in the short term to establish a system called communism and then after we've established the system we will give the power back and the political class will disappear that's what lenin said never worked like that but the interesting thing is is that now the politicians got their centralized power on a, on a communist system because you need to get people to do stuff so you become powerful as a politician they always forget to get give back the power they always forget there's no example of a communist system where they actually became communists they all become a, a maoist system or a leninist system where you centralize power and it, when you get to you go to people you stand in front of them and you really tell them about this great idea about communism are we all going to live in this wonderful world eventually and people are really excited about this and they work very hard and they work hard and gradually people start wondering about this and they don't work that hard anymore and now you have to get them you really have to you know push them a little bit to start working hard and you start have to start implementing laws and gradually the system becomes a system where you force people into doing things because they don't want to do it because they don't believe in the idea anymore and essentially what we have today if we to look at these two systems we have a system of freedom or you have a system of fear and that's the difference between a system of a free market system and a system of collectivism or communism that's the difference between the two we are we today <clears throat> i'm afraid if you look at the south african economy and you look at the policies that we've been following recently without a doubt we are moving to the left we're becoming more centralized we're getting a government that's more involved in all sort of things we're getting a government that's taking more and more power we're getting a government that's telling us more and more what we can even what we can eat i read an article today where the minister of um, health told me or told us that he's going to implement laws to limit our salt intake because he knows better and it's not only the democrat the anc that's moving to the left if you analyze the policies of the democratic alliance they are also moving to the left it's also becoming more of a socialist and interventionist political policies i've got 14 examples here and i can i can go into some of them if you want to for example the ndp recently the constitutional court also made a verdict i've got plenty the 
the uh, expropriation bill, you can have a look at that if you want to, the bilateral agreements between South Africa and other countries in the world, 14 either uh, uh, laws that were promulgated, law policies or constitutional court statements, and all of these 14 things got one thing in common, and that they all undermine your private property rights. We've got we know all these silly comments that they have. If you if you if you if you drill for oil, for example, the government will take twenty percent of your company, and they have the right to take buy more at the price that they determine. Twenty years or fifteen odd years ago, government stole the state stole all the mineral rights in South Africa, and we know all these sort of things. The the, the expropriation bill. Uh, now gives the right, the, the, the state the right, uh, and according to the constitutional law, the constitutional law recently said, if the state expropriates something, anything, not only land, anything, if they take something on and they hold it on behalf of somebody else, then that is not expropriation, and they do not have to pay you for that, for example. So, without a doubt, private property rights are under attack today. And private property rights, the most single most important right, that one golden threat that evolved over time, is being undermined by our political leaders today. If you look at the efficiency of the state today, and this, and I can go in, in this, I mean, uh, this is not my, this is just a summary of the Auditor General's report. The state is not only being badly run, the state is, a, is probably the single biggest threat to the South African economy. Look at the Auditor General's report. This is the Auditor General's report. I'll put it on our website if you want to have a look at this. The local authorities, the provinces, the national departments, the state-owned enterprises, most of them are pretty much a disaster. The South African Airways, for example, is a, is a parasitic institution. <laughs> uh, ESCOM, we've calculated ESCOM. ESCOM is costing the South African economy approximately 300 billion rand annually in lost production. That's the cost of ESCOM. We just read that the, the, the energy fund, 1.3 billion rand, that they do not really know what happened to that. It's sort of gone. We know that they're thinking of selling. It's called privatization in the real world, but they give it another name. They need to get money somewhere else because they've run out of money because all these state-owned enterprises are badly run. It's a disaster. So the state is not being... In fact, the state, the, the civil service in South Africa lies like a wet blanket over the spirit and over the flames of entrepreneurship in the economy. It's not me saying that. That is the Auditor General saying that. So how can you protect yourself from all these th sort of things? We are asset managers, and it is important for you to protect your assets and protect, look after yourselves. And maybe just let me make a, just a suggestion. The, the, probably the best book that I've ever read on economics and on politics, and that is called Animal Farm. If you haven't read Animal Farm, please get Animal Farm. What an amazing, amazing book. Well, perhaps the second best book. Oh, maybe it's another one. All right. <laughs> what can you do to protect yourself? Clearly, private property rights are under threat today. One way of doing that is to gear your, 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 your property. That means borrow against it. If you want to start a new business, borrow money from the banks, and the banks will carry some of the risk, for example. That's one example. But make sure you do the sums. Make sure... It, it makes sense for you. Make sure it all adds up. Don't just go out here and borrow money because you want to borrow money. But that's an example of protecting yourselves. Another example is that make sure they put some of your assets abroad. Put at least, say, 25, a rule of thumb is 25% of your portfolio should be invested abroad. Make sure of the structures like trusts and companies and structure it in such a way that you can protect your property from the onslaught of the politicians. Liquid assets are generally easier to move around than fixed assets. Doesn't mean you have to sell your house straight away. You know, they're not going to take your house tomorrow morning. But that's an example of how you can protect yourself. Rent rather than buy. For example, we've got farmers, uh, clients that are farmers. Government bought the property from them, their farms, and they gave us the money to manage. And now they're renting the farms back for next to nothing. So they've got the farms and the cash. That's an example of what you can do to hedge yourself against the onslaught. Get foreign partners. That's a very good example. If you've got a foreign partner, although we're getting rid of the bilateral agreements, but if you have a foreign partner, then you've got another government.
that's going to put pressure on government if they start doing silly things. Don't break the law. I'm mean, not suggesting that. Certainly not. What I do suggest, pay as little tax as possible. Don't pay too much tax. Pay as little tax as possible. Don't break any laws. Make sure everything is up to date. And join organizations that will also support you in protecting your private property rights. And there are plenty of organizations available. Okay. I just want to touch a little bit on one or two things about what's happening on the global economy at the moment. Now, I wanted to write my, my idea about writing a book is that I started off by thinking there must be 10 laws. 10 sounds like a nice round number. There must be 10 economic laws. So I was trying to think of 10 laws and write a book about the 10 laws of economics. I couldn't get to 10. I got to about 4 or so. So I'm really battling to get 10 laws of economics. But there are two laws that I really believe in. In economics the one law is that economics is about people and people react to incentives so if you see people doing funny things just see if you can figure out what the incentive is and then you will know why they do this and the economy is nothing but just all of us the market is just all of us the market is not some some guy somewhere we are the market so and we react to things we sell the rand for example if we don't trust government we sell the rand, for example, if interest rates are too low. We react to incentives. That's one law in economics. Another law in economics is that all returns always converge. Repeat that. All returns always converge. What does that mean? It simply means that if you have an investment that gives you a 10% return and another one that gives you 5% return, you're going to take your money from the 5% return and put it into the 10% return. And what will happen? The yield will keep on falling on the 10% return and the 5% return, the yield will go up. And eventually, the returns on these two assets will be exactly the same. All returns always converge. But of course, we know that that asset will give you X percent and another one will give you less. And the reasons why you have different returns from different asset classes at the moment is simply because of reasons like, for example, liquidity differences or because of risk, perceived risks, or because of issues like, for example, regulations or whatever. But the underlying force is for all returns always to converge. So all returns on all asset classes, classes tend to move, try to want to get to, together. They want to converge to a certain place. So what is going on? What is going on in the world at the moment? And this is what's going on. Now, I think this is perhaps... The single most important graph that you can think of in economics. Now I've got a, the yield curves of different countries here. And the yield curves, for example, I have the yield curve of the United States. Is that one over there? Now a yield curve is on a short term. You've got short term interest rates set by central banks. And then gradually if you move along further on, on the yield curve, you've got medium term and longer term interest rates. And those interest rates are usually determined by supply and the mark for the demand forces in the economy. What it tells you, we've got different asset classes here that give you different returns. And as you move out into the future, the returns actually go up, which makes sense because there's more risk involved. But apart from that, the economy is supposed to grow from here to there. So the difference between here and there, that difference there, is actually economic growth. So the yield curves tell us what the market thinks future economic growth is going to be. And the steeper your yield curve, the stronger future economic growth is likely to be. Look at the United States, for example. And the shallower a yield curve, the lower market is expecting future economic growth. And it's that one over there, for example, which is a flattish one, although it's high. It's a flat one. The difference between there and there is very little. And that is South Africa's yield curve. So already one can see that the markets are discounting in a relatively strong growth for America. And that one over there is the UK. You can see that. While European economic growth and Japanese economic growth, the market is discounting much lower economic growth. So already South Africa's future economic growth doesn't look that promising. Let's have a look at South Africa's future economic growth. Of course, there are factors like, for example, inflation. 
affecting your yield curve as well. So that is the yield curve with inflation. So I take inflation out, and this is our yield curve without inflation. And the yield curve in South Africa tells us economic growth in South Africa for the next 30 years is likely to be at 2% or less. That's what the market is telling us. Which I don't believe, of course. But that's the, what the market is discounting at the moment. Of course, as we go along in a, in a year's time, things will change. And the market will change its, its mind to what, what can be expected in terms of economic growth. But at least for now, the market is telling us that South Africa's economic growth potential is 2% annually. Okay, I said all asset classes returns tend to converge. So, one of the very important asset classes in the world, of course, is cash. If you put your money in cash, another very important one is the capital market, the bond market, of which I've just showed you the yield curve. So, what's been happening to cash or the, uh, the, the asset class called cash? And this is what's been happening to that. Interest rates have been falling and in some instances, interest rates today are in negative territory. In, the Euro, in, in Europe, for example, the ECB recently reduced some of the interest rates to below zero. So if you want to put money at the central bank, if you're a bank and you want to put money at the central bank in Europe, you will have to pay for that privilege. Interest rates are negative. But the same happened to the bond market. Interest rates are low. If you look at the bond market, they are the bond market is just longer term interest rates. The the, the Netherlands, they have the longest history, the recorded history on, they, they've got, they, they had very sophisticated financial markets, relatively sophisticated five, six hundred years ago, where they actually also uh, traded in financial instruments. And you can, from that, you can derive uh, the, the actual yield curve in a way in the Netherlands. Interest rates in the ne Netherlands today is the lowest it's been in 500 years. We haven't seen interest rates this low globally ever before. And this tells you that economic growth, global economic growth, is likely to disappoint over the next at least couple of years. Now, we do know that the Americans are not doing too badly at the moment. I do not think it is sustainable. In fact, we've seen today that the bond market, the 10 year, and if, if there's one number, one, one, just one economic indicator that I can leave you with the single most important one. It's called the 10-year bonds or the TB, the American 10-year bond yield. It went to below 2% today. See that? So it's going down. So we think low interest rates is good news. It certainly is not. It is telling us that the world economy is not doing well. So the American economy is doing surprisingly well in the short term. I do not believe it is sustainable. The same with the Europeans. I think we're going to see quantitative easing in Europe. They're going to start buying all sort of funny things like what they did in the United States. And I believe the Japanese economy is a bug in search of a windscreen. Let me give you some one or two examples of the Japanese economies. The debt levels, the Japanese government debt levels today is 250% of the economy. That's how much money they owe. If they want to borrow money for 10 years, fix, they can borrow money for 0.5%. It doesn't make sense. Why can they do that? Because people do not buy. If people do not buy, you cannot get inflation up. Inflation keeps on falling. And if you do not have demand, economies do not grow. And that's the reason why the yield curve is sagging down like that on the long end. So I'm afraid long-term economic growth in the rich world is something that we're probably not going to see for quite some time. That, of course, is a different story in the other economies in the world, like the Chinese. They've slowed down quite a lot. And I think the Chinese economy will, will actually, not only the Chinese, the Indians, and Sub-Saharan Africa is the region that's been doing the best the past 10 years of all regions in the world. So the developing world is likely to do quite well. The Chinese economy of will slow down, but they're changing their business model. Part of the reason why the Chinese economy is likely to do well is because they stopped eating rice. They're giving the rice to the chickens and they eat the chickens. And in a way, that is exactly what is happening. Because as your living standards go up, you want to eat more protein. But you want to have a flat and a 
flat screen TV and you want to go on holiday and you want to have a car. So the Chinese are gradually turning into the world's consumers. Uh, but it's, it's going to be a slow process. It's a plain, painful process. And you're running a lot of political risk changing that business model. But that, that, that's a benefit. That's a benefit of being South African in that we are part of the BRICS and we are part of this emerging developing economy. I'm sure you guys have heard of this thing called quantitative easing. Now, this, this formula here, somebody won a Nobel Prize on economics in this. His name was Milton Friedman. Now, let me explain it to you. This is, it took me a long time to figure this out, but I, I think I've got a bit of a grip on it at the moment. Let's assume there are two guys on an island. The one guy produces one apple a day. The other guy produces a pear a day. And you've got 10 rand on this island. So you take this 10 rand and give it to the one guy and he will take his apple and give it to this guy. And the next day you will take the 10 rand and give it to the other guy and he will take the pear and he will buy the pear. So every day you will produce one apple, one pear and the, every day the, the 10 rand will go here and the next day it will go back. That's my economic model. Now what's going to happen if I put 20 rand into this system? Well, now all of a sudden we've got 20 rand that can exchange hands once a day. Will prices go up? So we've increased money. Will prices now go up? So will this 10 rand, will this apple cost 20 rand now? Or will we produce two apples? Q. And production will go up. That's the question. Now, well, of course, depending on what school of thought you are, it can either be an increase in prices, which we call inflation, or it can be a, an increase in production, which you call economic growth. Now, what the central bankers have been doing in recent years, they've been making a lot of money out of nothing, and they call it quantitative easing, and they've been pumping this money into the system. So they've made, they made this 10 rand, 20 rand, and then 40 rand, and then 100 rand. So they made this a lot. Just coming back to our simple economic model, guy A and guy B producing an apple and a pear with 10 rand. If they can somehow figure out how to get the 10 rand to move not once between them a day, but they're going to get a guy that can run very fast on this island and he can actually get the 10 rand to go there and back. So you increase the number of times you use this 10 rand. Then you can actually make the 10 rand use it twice per day, velocity, and you get the same impact. Either prices can go up or quantity can go up. That's the velocity of money. That's if you understand this, you are in line for a Nobel Prize in economics. Easy. Money times how much you use this money, prices times how much you produce. That is Nobel Prize stuff. So what's happened? We've been producing and we've been making all this money, yet we do not get inflation. And why is that so? Because velocity... This one didn't go up. It didn't even stay where it was. It came down globally. So all this money is into the system, but people simply use less of it. Yet, a very clever economist once noticed in the Wild West, that if you pick up a nugget of gold, and you, the guy that picks up the nugget, nugget of gold, he can use it for all sorts of things. And he gets a lot of benefit out of this. You can buy a bottle of whiskey with this, a new set of boots, and a horse, and he can make use of certain services, for instance. So he gets a lot of benefits from this. But the people, the guy that sell the services, the, the whiskey bottle, or the, or the boots, or the horse to him, they also get a benefit out of this nugget of gold, but a little bit less than what he got. And gradually, as you move away from this nugget of gold, the benefits diminishes gradually. It's like a, throwing a pebble into a pond. So what happens if you create money? Because now all of a sudden we create another, um, a nugget of gold out of nothing. We call it quantitative easing. Central banks do that. They make money out of nothing. It is a nugget of gold. And who benefits from that? The guys closest to this nugget of gold. And who are they? They are stock exchanges. They are the banks. They are the big financial institutions. And they are the wealthy people, like you guys, that are invested on the financial markets. Who are the guys that are far away from this nugget of gold? They are the poor people that do not participate 
in the financial markets. And that's why you get share prices like the S&P equity prices going to record levels, including the JSE. So despite weak economic growth, we've got equity markets and financial markets reaching record levels, including the JSE. Although we've been a bit of a bit of a hiccup the last couple of, of days or so. All right. There's something else that governments do in order to try to support the countries. I've mentioned this. And that is apart from very low interest rates and quantitative easing, you can borrow a lot of money and you can spend a lot of money in order to support your economy. So government usually what they do, they increase the fiscal deficits and they borrow more money, spending this extra money in order to support your economies. But you can carry so much debt and not more. Now I mentioned that the total debt of the Japanese is 250% of the economy. Fortunately for the Japanese, they can borrow money for 0.5%. So I've calculated a new proxy, and we call it, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture between your debt levels and the price that you pay. And I calculated the new index, and I put the United States at zero, and measure everything against the United States. Now this is the debt levels, this new of the Japanese, much higher than that of the United States. South Africa's fiscal debt levels is actually higher than that of Japan, not because our debt levels are higher, but because where the Japanese pay 0.5% for money if they borrow money, we pay nearly 9% for money if we borrow money. The only country in the world that's got higher debt levels than what we have in a major country is that of India. Of course, if you look at the Greeks, for example, they've got debt levels close to 400 on this index, but they have a big brother called the European Central Bank. We do not have that. The point I'm trying to make is we have to be extremely careful because our debt levels, our government debt levels, are extremely high. And I'm going to get back to that just now. So are we going to see the markets just popping, the bubbles bursting? And I don't think so. And the reason why I think it's not going to burst is because a typical bubble, a typical financial bubble, uh, consists of a number of elements. One is that you get households, the private sector, to borrow money to buy a house, for example. The house price goes up a little bit. Oh, it's not a bad idea. So maybe I can just borrow a little bit from my house to buy a BM, Beamer as well, to buy a car as well. And maybe I should buy another. Let's borrow a little bit more money and buy a, a, a house in, at the sea as well. And that price has been, the neighbor sees that. And more people start borrowing money, more people start buying houses. And as house prices go up, I borrow my house and start using it for consumption expenditure in the economy. And property prices just keep on going up and up and up and up. The important thing with a private sector credit driven asset bubble is that you need households or the private sector to keep on borrowing. So asset bubbles are typically blown up by private sector credit extension. What do we have today? Do we have private sector credit extension? Do we have a lot of people borrowing money? And the answer is no. Velocity is in fact falling. So who's doing all this blowing up? And it's central banks. And what happens when a bubble bursts? The property prices will start falling. Someone is going to get panicky and he sells his house. And all of a sudden, all property prices start falling and banks stop lending money. And the oxygen of a bubble called private sector credit extension stops and the bubble goes pop. That's how bubbles burst. We do not have that kind of bubble today on the financial markets. We've got a different kind of bubble, a bubble created by central banks. And central banks do not run for the door, unlike individuals and unlike the private sector. So for that reason, I believe we will have financial markets and equity markets at very, very high levels for quite a long period of time, uh, despite the fact that I think it is overvalued. And I'm talking about all asset classes, uh, cash and bond market, um, equity market, uh, and the like. So, so I'm not too concerned about very high valuations for, for, property, uh, for, for equity markets, for example. Have a look. And anyway, you haven't got a choice. You have to put your money somewhere. Inflation, there's a couple of things on inflation. Inflation, 6.5% out in South Africa is likely to stay more or less there, especially with the currency being under some pressure. 
interest rates in South Africa has been on a downward trajectory recently. That's the repo rate. You've seen a bit of an increase in interest rates now. I think the Reserve Bank, because inflation is above the targeted range, we've used monetary policy. You can't use monetary policy anymore. Interest rates are very low. Inflation is above 6%. We call this stagflation. Inter inflation is too high, growth is too low. You can't, do, you can't use monetary policy anymore. So the Reserve Bank is likely to do nothing. Or maybe gradually increase interest rates. So don't expect much from the monetary authorities. Unemployment likely to remain very high. I'm not going to go too much into this, but unemployment uh, is very high in South Africa for a number of reasons. And one very important reason has to do with the fact that we are the world is in a way in a technological or an industrial revolution. A different kind of revolution where you need very, very special skills and we simply do not produce those skills. So, unemployment, the more we, not only in South Africa, many other countries in the world. Economic growth. The IMF just downgraded us to 1.4. I think they're a little bit optimistic. I think 1.3. If we are lucky, next year probably 1.8 or probably lower. Just something about economists. Ask an economist for his estimates on economic growth next year. Do this. Test an economist. Ask him what economic growth is going to be next year. And I promise you, in 100% of the cases, he will tell you it's going to be higher than this year. Economists always say economic growth is going to be better in the future. They always do that. I can't figure it out why. So <laughs> that's what economists do. Not only economists, the IMF does this. The World Bank does it. The South African Reserve Bank. They all say it's going to go better in the future. That's not always the case, necessarily the case, of course. Okay, just something I want to share with you. This is new research. The Minister of Finance is getting, you know, he's, he's got a very important, he's, he's the single biggest player in the South African economy. He gets a lot of taxes out of the economy and spends this money. So let's see what's going on with the different, the various taxes. This is what they expected in personal income taxes. And this is the, our estimates on what he's likely to collect for the year. And this is the difference. And in our view, he's probably going to get a little bit more in personal income taxes than originally estimated for the current financial year, which sounds like a good idea. The thing is, if you analyze that a little bit, there are very few individuals actually paying all that money. And they are the high income categories. And they guys that do not lose their jobs. They've got very scarce skills. They're very well remunerated. And they keep their jobs. And they keep on paying taxes. So quite interesting, when the economy slows down, Personal income taxes stay there. Personal income tax collections stay. Corporate income taxes, company taxes. Look at this one. A significant under collection in taxes. Because corporate income taxes is much more sensitive to the economic cycle than personal income taxes, for instance. And not only uh, corporate income taxes. Remember, corporates, when the economy does well, the, the corporates pay more taxes as well. They make a lot of money, pay more taxes. But they also pay dividends. So they stop paying dividends if they don't make money. And the under collection of 10 odd billion that we expect on corporate income taxes. Value added tax, that's actually the second most important tax, more important than corporate income taxes. Value added taxes, since I've been, when, since I've started analyzing government finance many, many years ago, value added taxes in just about all instances exceeded the ministers of finances estimates. It, what, it say, what it says about South Africans is that we like to spend. That's simply what it says. And for the first time, since I've started analyzing fiscal finances, is that value-added tax is likely to come in below the budgeted estimate. So what does it tell us? It tells us we've got a consumer that is tired. A consumer that's being battered by high energy costs, electricity, petrol prices, food prices. A consumer that's being battered by e-tolls, rising costs in local, local authority costs and so on. The consumer is tired, and the consumer has stopped spending. And we've always, we could always expect the consumer to pull this economy up. The consumer is not there anymore. The consumer is very hearty in the last couple of um, months and years. A couple of other ones, the few levy and the like. If you add everything together, then you, the chances are that we're going to see the following. Expenditure, like, or the revenue in the Minister of Finance is probably going to be in the region of about 16 billion or so below the budgeted estimates. Our estimates range between, say, 15 billion and 30 billion. Expenditure, we keep that more or less in line with, with the budget. 
which will give us a fiscal deficit of approximately 25 billion or so bigger than the original budgeted estimates. This is what it looks like. Remember, you can use your fiscal accounts if you want to support your economy. That's the red line. So you spend more. When the economy goes through some difficulty in 2008, 2009, you increase spending, the red line, because taxes come under pressure. You open up this thing called a fiscal deficit. You support your economy. The idea is the moment the economy starts growing, then you bring the red line down again and pay off debt. They forgot to do that. So we've got huge levels of fiscal debt levels now. This is our debt levels. When Trevor Manuel took over as Minister of Finance, that was the debt levels. We were one rating, this is Moody's, one rating away from junk there. Okay? Trevor Manuel it took him 10 years to bring it down to 25% to GDP. 10 years. It took us four years to double that. And this is where it's going to go now. So we're going to see fiscal debt levels exceeding 50% now, within a year, and higher next year and so on. This excludes the guarantees to South African Airways and Eskom and those sort of places. Chances are we're going to see another downgrade. Um, if Standard & Poor's downgrade us, then I'm not too worried about Moody's because we're still too... Two or three ratings above. So they're probably going to give us, they have to bring us down anyway to bring us in line with the other rating agencies. On, on, on S&P, I think we won the rating just above investment. If S&P downgrades us, then we junk bonds. That sounds like many nuts. That means long-term interest rates will go up, government bond rates, that debt levels will become really unsustainable, the rent will come under pressure, inflation will go up, short-term interest rates will have to be increased, and that means weak economic growth and everything that goes with that. This is something that we need to be very concerned about. The Minister of Finance will give his medium-term budget next week. So listen to him. Okay, another problem that we have. That's one issue that we have. We have a huge fiscal deficit adding to the fiscal debt level. We've got another issue here in that we've got a fairly large current account deficit. Now, current account deficit tells you a lot of things in your economy. A current account is simply the difference between your imports and your exports. Now, we have a deficit of about 6% um, odd uh, for current account deficit relative to GDP in South Africa. What does it tell us? It tells us, first of all, that we import more than what we export. A current account deficit also tells you that we consume more than what we produce. A current account deficit also tells you that we save less than what we invest. And we don't invest enough, by the way. A current account deficit tells you that you are a capital scarce country. If you don't have enough, if we have a current account deficit of 6% of GDP, it means we produce 100, but we consume 106. So if you're a farmer, you produce 100 bags of millies, but you eat 106 bags of millies. And you can only do that if you borrow 6 bags of millies from your neighbor. And that's what we've been doing borrowing millies from our neighbor. Now they're asking their millies back. And that's a very important reason why the RAND is currently under pressure. So, where is the savings coming from? And who are the savers in South Africa? This big blue block here are the corporates, the companies. That's how much companies are saving in South Africa. They're the only real savers in South Africa. This is how much individuals, households are saving. That small one over there. Very few individuals can retire financially independent because we don't save. This is how much the Minister of Finance is saving, which is a nice amount of money. The problem is it is below the zero line. <laughs> so the Minister of Finance, while the rest of us, remember savings is postponed consumption. I produce something today, but I don't consume it today. I put it away for future consumption. The Minister of Finance is doing exactly the opposite. He's consuming today, tomorrow's production. It is the opposite of saving. It's not the creation of capital, it is the destruction of capital. This amount of money is equal to approximately 100 billion rand annually. If we can get the Minister of Finance just to stop this saving, then the current account deficit will halve. It's bad because if you're, um, when I elect it to my students, I always tell them, what's the difference? Why is it bad to dissave? Well, dissaving is like, 
If you borrow money on your house to build, and I've told this story before, if you borrow money on your house to build a new room for a new baby, that's capital expenditure and that is cool. But if you borrow money on your house, on your mortgage, to go to Mauritius to make the baby, that is not cool. That's the difference. And this is what our dear Minister of Finance is doing. He's borrowing long-term money and he's using that money for short-term current expenditure and he's destroying 100 billion rands worth of capital in South Africa with all the consequences with that. Okay, where should you put your money? That's a very difficult one because all asset classes are very expensive. And I always tell people, it's like, you know, this is the, we are asset managers. I mean, I can't put my, your money under my bed. I can't put your money in a gold mine in the Congo. I'm going to lose it. This is what I, this, these are my options, either local or international. Now, it is pretty much the same as, you know, you want to go out for the evening. And you want to have a you want to want a date for the evening, and there are four sisters, and you can pick one of the four sisters. The problem is they are all four of them are very very ugly. <laughs> and this is the this is what we that that's what you do as an asset man. You've got four ugly sisters to pick from, and which one do you pick? You pick the easy one, I guess. So it becomes a relative game. Now I can tell you relatively. For example, relatively speaking, local bonds. Are better than local equities. Relatively speaking, American equities are better than local uh, bonds or local equities. It's extremely difficult to be an asset manager today. We have to put the, our clients' money somewhere, but all the systems are very, very ugly. I actually do like property still, listed property, that's listed property. And I do believe equities uh, are probably going to give you a relatively good, not a good return, but a relatively good return. In fact, we are asset managers, and I've got, I've got a product where I can guarantee you a loss. We put some of our, some of our clients' money in a guaranteed loss-making product. And that product is called the money market. The money market will give you a return currently about 5.5% or so. The inflation rate is 6.5%. So money market, and that's before inflation, is a guaranteed loss on your money. Okay. Let's have a look what's been happening to the South African rand since 1970. Inflation is not a good thing, it's a bad thing. If you have 100 rands worth, this is 100 rand in 1970, but gradually this 100 rand was eroded because of inflation. How much of that is left today of this 100 rand? One rand. 43 years. It took the Reserve Bank 43 years because they are the money maker in South Africa, the Reserve Bank. It took them 43 years to destroy 99% of the value of our currency. If you bought dollars in 1970 and you, could, and you would use the same amount of rands today, how many dollars can you buy? And the answer is you can buy three rands worth of dollars today. So we've lost the rands, lost 97% of its value against the US dollar. And the reason why it's not 1% is because they also experienced inflation the past 40 odd years or so. That brings me to a very interesting thing. And I just let me get to the summary of this. Um, I believe I'm the most important person in the world. I believe I should have the right to do with my labor, with my property, whatever I want to. And there's only one thing that limits me, and that is your rights. That means we are the most important people in the world. And I demand to be treated as such. Unfortunately, politicians got a habit of trying to centralize stuff. They want to take more power and they want to take my rights away to decide for myself. And they monopolize all sort of things. They've also monopolized money. Uh, they've monopolized money because that's a very, very powerful tool. If you are, there's a lot of money also to be made out of making money. So the central bank, although it's privately owned, the central bank pays all these extra profits that they make over to the, South, to the South African government. I'm a shareholder in the South African Reserve Bank. I've got 200 shares. And the reason why I've got 200 shares is because you get invited to the annual meeting, the annual general meeting of the South African Reserve Bank, where you sit in there and you get the, the reports of the South African Reserve Bank, and they serve a very nice bolt of them. That's the reason why I'm there. But, the, the, but in, in the reality, the Reserve Bank is in full control of, of government. We know that Lesetia Kanyaga, for example, was appointed by the president. And by the way, I think he's going to be a good governor at the Reserve Bank. But the reality is that 
I do not have control over money anymore. But there's something happening, and that's called it's something it's called virtual currency. Now, Bitcoin is an example of this. Now, please, what I'm going to tell you now, don't jump out and go and buy bitcoins and change your world. I'm just trying, I'm trying to see what's probably going to happen over the next 10 years. Looking at this trajectory of development of how we evolved over time, maybe we are at the threshold of something new. Maybe this is another evolve, a never, never puzzle, a puzzle in in our uh, evolvement of as uh, to become a real sophisticated economy eventually and a real civilization where the power is where it's supposed to be, and that's with us. What if we get a virtual currency and it's there already? Bitcoin, for example, exists already and many other examples of virtual currencies as well. Remember, if you have a virtual currency, one of the uh, advantages of a virtual currency, and I'm not going to go through the technical part, is that nobody can see what you are doing. If I have my cell phone with me, I can transfer money from me to him, and nobody will know it. Only the two of us will know. There's no in financial intermediary, intermediaries, and nobody can see how much I transfer to him, Unless you have the PIN code for my phone, the password. So what's the world going to look like if we actually do succeed in implementing a virtual currency like Bitcoin, for example? Let's have a look at fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, the most important revenue source for the Minister of Finance is personal income taxes, which is actually a financial transaction because he can follow that. He can see how much money is deposited into the bank and he knows, and taken out of the banks of, the, of, of my employer, and he knows, he can check how much money is taken out here and then deposited in here. So and he can tax that. If my employer starts paying me in virtual currency, or if I go to a, a, a cafe and buy a, a cappuccino with virtual currency, nobody can see that. And if you push that to the extreme, then eventually the Minister of Finance will not be able to, to, to tax any financial transaction. Which means inevitably the taxes must come down. But that only leaves the Minister of Finance with two sources of revenue. If you cannot tax financial transactions, there are only two things that you can tax. The one is physical property, houses, property, farms and things, like what we have. Or it's called the poll tax. So that's maybe what the future is going to look like. But eventually we will get rid of this, of financial transaction taxes, on all financial transactions, and maybe find something else, like, for example, the property tax and poll taxes. Also keep in mind that if you have a virtual currency, then you do not need a financial intermediary. It also means you do not need rands or dollars or drachmas or whatever anymore you do not need a central bank anymore because we transfer money between the two of us and we do not need banks for that matter so central banks push to its its extreme in a world of a virtual currency they will not be central banks anymore they will not be banks anymore they will not be monetary policy anymore there will not be somebody deciding what interest rates will be. It will be between me and the next individual. Trade will be so much easier. You do not have to change your bitcoins or whatever virtual currency, your rands into dollars and your dollars into ruble. You can use your virtual currency anywhere. You can email it to anybody. You can SMS it to anybody. You can. You, it's so much easier to trade and it will be absolutely amazing for international trade. Keep in mind that the amount of virtual currency is limited. So this virtual currency, a limited amount of virtual currency, will be used for more things as we as it becomes more popular throughout the economy. And inevitably what will happen is that the value of this virtual currency will go up and the prices of things will come down. So suddenly we will live in a world of deflation, which is not such a bad thing. This, one of the strongest growth spurts in the United States was in the late uh, 1800s during a time of deflation. So don't be scared of deflation. You can grow in a world of deflation as well. The downside to virtual currencies is that if I want to send money to, if I want to buy child pornography or contraband or send money to 
some weird guide somewhere. I can do that and nobody can follow that. That means that I'm, I have the responsibility. And the responsibility is, supposed to be, it's, is where it's supposed to be and that is with me. But the most wonderful thing of an, a virtual currency is that it will erode the power of politicians. And it will put the power where it's supposed to be and that's in the hands of people. Now, on that high note, maybe just one or two comments about the South African economy. We ran out of options. Monetary policy is not available anymore. We ran out of fiscal policy options as well. Fiscal policy is just not available anymore. The politicians have painted themselves into a corner there. There's, we can't do anything else now. And now we've got two choices. You break through the left wall or you break through the right wall. You can't break through the left wall because our institutions are strong. The Reserve Bank is not going to allow, uh, it's not going to start printing money in Zim style, for instance. The, the public protector will keep on doing what she's doing. The press will keep on writing the things that they are writing. So it's very difficult for politicians to really destroy this economy because there are so many checks and balances. That means that they haven't got the choice but to take the right option. And they're doing it already. That's the good news. Yesterday's newspapers, they speculating that there's a possibility that the state will sell its, I think it's 20 share, 20 percent share in Vodacom. That is worth 25 odd billion. That is privatization. Of course, they will never say, use that terrible world, but they haven't got a choice because they ran out of money. They owe 40 percent of Telcom. They will have to sell that as well. It's called privatization. The name of that specific policy is called New Liberalism. They will have to do that because they haven't got a choice. And that's the good news. My suspicion is we're going to see polit politicians and political policy turning over the next, not years, months, not because they want to, but because they haven't got a choice. And apart from that, something else that's really working in favor of South Africa is the fact that we're part of the emerging world developing world, we're part of Africa, and we really stand with two, one foot in the developed world with an exceptionally domestic, uh, exceptionally well regulated and liquid and integrated financial markets like the JSE where we are today. But the other foot is standing in the rest of the world where the real strong demand is going to come from in future. If you want to start a pothole fixing business, don't try to start that business in Germany. But there are plenty portals to fix in Africa. Thank you very much. If there are questions, I'll take those. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure. Got it. Inflation actually started to catch up with the yeah. US dollar, where eventually nobody really wants a dollar like the rent. That, you know, that I can't, I don't know. I really don't know. That, that, I mean, that question keeps me awake. But let me just uh, give you one or two pointers here. What is quantitative easing? You take the central bank that prints a lot of money, and they will take this money and take it, give it to the bank, and they will take something in return. They will take TVs, treasury bills, US treasury bills, for example. So what are they doing? What is the Federal Reserve? It is nothing but a government agency. It's, it's an extension of government. What is a TV? A TV is a liability against the government. What is a $10 note? A $10 note is a liability against the Fed, which is the government. So, uh, so what is quantitative easing? Quantitative easing is simply where you exchange one government liability for another government liability. And Ben Bernanke once said, he said, the problem with quantitative easing is that it works in practice, but it doesn't work in theory. And that's exactly the case. Because you exchange one, it, that's essentially what you are doing. But you're right, uh, that's not the only way through which money is created. Money is created through all sort of other means as well. 
And eventually you get all this money. If you look at the Fed's uh, balance sheet, they've got $4 trillion on their balance sheet. Um, and it's, it's got to end somewhere. And yes, I think eventually inflation must be the in inevitable result of all of these experiments. But when is that going to happen? I don't know, because the Japanese got levels of 250% debt. That's money creation in a way. It's not... It's not money debt. It's not money creation like in yen, but it's money creation in the form of, of, of a government debt, which is money in a way. I've just explained that, and I don't know when that is going to happen. But I can tell you, the moment that monster is unleashed, we're going to see the mother of all inflations globally. But we're not there yet. Yes. Well, the, 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 at the moment we're not there. They still now, they still trust the government now. And, and the reason why they buy the dollar at the moment is that if you put money in Germany and the government, the German boons, you get one, less than 1%. If you put money in yen, you get less than, you get half a percent. If you put money in, in France, a bankrupt company, a country like France, you get 1.3%. But if you put money in, in TBs, you get 2%. So that's the reason, I guess. Because the yield is not much, but it's slightly better. And that's the reason why we see the uh, U.S. yields coming on. Let me make a bold prediction. In a year's time, we're going to see U.S. yields at 1%. We're going to see the the boons at half a percent. And we're going to see the French probably at 0 0.6, 0 0.7% or so. And we're going to see the Greeks currently at 7.5%, probably down to 3%. Yeah, whatever. So that's the world in which we're living. And yields are just going, just collapsing. Okay, then something. I don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> okay, let's let's give the gentleman there a chance, and uh, uh, I'll give you a chance. And uh, I, and, and our time is actually Limited. over, so we'll only take those last two, and then we can uh, continue with the networking session outside. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to just ask one question: What is your economic opinion regarding the sudden drop in the oil prices? Taking into account that the indices are dropping as well, yeah, exactly. that to me just does, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Is there a good time to go into oil ETNs or not? Thanks. Excellent, excellent question. Now let me speculate. Uh, I think the, most, the single most important driver behind dropping the oil price today is a weaker international economy. We've got recently some bad numbers out of the US, so that's a very important short-term driver, and I think a medium-term driver as well. Secondly, the shale gas thing in the United States. They're going to be Solves itself, they will produce all the energy needs within a year or so. So if they've got a new, a lot of new energy. A third very important reason is that when the oil price spiked to $160, what was it, four or five years ago, everybody was just pumping oil and in, 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 uh, putting new um, facilities up and uh, drilling for oil and so on. And that oil is coming onto the market at the moment, or at least it is potentially there. A very other important reason is recently they started with this instability in the Middle East. We all know that pushes up the oil price. So what do you do? You stock up your own oil. So you've got these very high levels in inventory at the moment, all governments, and suddenly the oil price collapses and now they've got all this oil. So the combination of all these things is that the oil price is coming down. I think what is going to happen with the oil price is that it, the level of the oil price is between 70 and 90, I would guess. That's more or less the correct level. And I do not see the oil price going to above $100 for quite some time. That's not going to happen. Just the last one, uh, Davi. Yes. Um, we've, we've got a, a great example of a failed state, which is Venezuela, you know, world's highest inflation, world's highest bond yields and yes. dollars, etc. Why, why don't the, you know, the, the thinking economists stress that more clearly to the, uh, the, the, low, the low IQ, the low temperature IQ people in government, that, that you have a good example of a truly failed state? Yes. And you could go down the street. Yes. Um... Yeah, uh, it's called, uh, they, they actually got a name for it um, in Venezuela. By the way, they are good friends with the wonderful name Economic Freedom Fighters. They like to point Venezuela, Chavez, they call it Chavesta. That's that economic policy, Chavesta. And in a way, Brazil is in a way following the same thing. Yeah, well, we do that all the time. I can't, I know many politicians. Uh, I really do know, and I, and, I, and I do not know one politician in South Africa that do not want to, the South African economy to work. I think the problem that we have in South Africa with our government is that we've got a government that is ideologically confused. I really I mean that. In, in 1994, we had the Joe Slovos. They provided the, 
sort of the basis, the ideological basis. They understood their own philosophy. You could debate with him because he actually read Karl Marx. You can't debate with, who's that guy? Blade? Yeah, I mean, he doesn't understand his own ideology, and that really makes them. Uh, I mean, the ANC and the the, the 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 confusion is it's, it's terrible. The the Gauteng, they're against the tolerance <laughs> national. <laughs> I mean, what a disaster! I think that's the problem. It's an it's a confusion, ideological. Confusion. It's a lack of leadership, I guess.